It's day 328 of reading and studying through the Bible in 365. My name is Kanoi. Welcome to Bible study. Definitely want to apologize for getting this video out a little bit late today. We've got family in town and yesterday on Thanksgiving, I actually spent most of my day in my room trying to edit those two videos that I told you about which ended up kind of being an editing disaster. We'll talk about that in just a little bit, but we are here, you guys, and so happy Friday. Happy Aloha Friday. It is day 328, and today we are jumping over to the book of Galatians, where Paul passionately corrects those who have perverted the truth of the gospel. That is what he calls it. That salvation, again, comes by faith alone, and there is nothing else we can do to earn it. But before we begin, if you are in agreement with us by being in this Bible study, by getting excited about the word, and you're loving it, if you could please hit that like button to let us know that you're with us and that you too want to see others get involved in this ministry, in this Bible study. If you're new here, please let us know where you're watching from in the world. Also make sure you're subscribed to the channel, hit the notification bell so you know when every video comes out. We've got extra videos coming up here. Otherwise, let's go ahead and pray and we will get started. Heavenly Father, we are so gracious today. The day after Thanksgiving doesn't make us any less grateful for who you are, what you've done, and for giving us another day on this earth. And the ability to be able to come here into your presence we humble our hearts before you lord and we are so grateful that we can do this we have the freedom to do it that we have the ability that we have the resources and so i just pray that we'll, we won't take that for granted but we will sit here today and be still before your word be still before your presence and i pray lord that you will silence any thoughts, any distractions that you will help to still our minds as well, because sometimes it's our minds that are more chaotic than anything. And so I pray that this time together will be one that is holy, that it will be held to a higher standard. And I just pray, Lord, that you will help us to be able to concentrate, to receive your wisdom, your knowledge, and will you just speak to us? I pray for a fresh revelation today. I pray for a fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit within each and every one of us. Forgive us, Lord, for our sins. Please just cleanse our hearts in this moment. Please purify us. Do what you need to do to refine us. And we give you full permission to do so, Lord. And if there's anything we need to do in order to make it right, if we need to go to somebody, ask for forgiveness, maybe give someone forgiveness, whatever that looks like, please help us to do that, Lord. Reveal to us who that person may be. And as always, I pray for a capacity, a greater capacity to forgive others, to give out the grace that you have given to us in good measure. And so we just pray that this time together will be honorable to you, that will bless your spirit. And may everything we do, our thoughts, our actions, our words that we speak, let it all be pleasing to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. All right, book of Galatians. Why are we skipping over to Galatians? Well, because Paul wrote it. And this is his first epistle written sometime around AD 50-ish. <laughs> we don't have a solid date, but that is the date that most scholars have come to conclude that it was written around that time, the audience being the churches of Galatia. Galatia is not a city, it is a region, uh, otherwise known as the Galatians. This is in present day Turkey. The purpose of this epistle is to correct the perverted gospel and to declare or reiterate the truth of the gospel, meaning salvation comes by grace through faith. So starting off here in chapter one, Paul, an apostle. So here he is declaring that he is an apostle, meaning he has been given divine authority to be able to speak these words to this church, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia. So this epistle, this letter is intended for multiple churches in this region to be passed around. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom the be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So here Paul is giving a quick summary of the good news that Christ died for you so that you could be delivered from darkness. Now this word deliver, it doesn't mean remove you from the evil that's in the world because that would be taking you out of the world, but more like sanctification or being set apart in the face of all of the evil and temptations of the world. So it looks to the redemptive work of Christ, which Paul speaks 
speaks more in detail about a little bit later. And Paul will use these two greetings, these two words here in his greetings, grace and peace. Grace was the typical or traditional Greek greeting, whereas peace was a traditional Hebrew greeting. And he likes to use those th two things together. Because if you remember, grace is the undeserved, unearned, unmerited favor that God gives to us. And it does go hand in hand because when you receive that grace from God, you receive Jesus in your life, it will bring that peace. So he likes to use those two words together. Verse six, I am astonished, meaning I am shocked that you all so quickly deserted him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. This is a works-based gospel that is being preached here, a false gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Now this word trouble brings to mind the word seasick in Greek, which one scholar said that this is referring to kind of the queasiness that this false gospel is bringing to the people where they are trying to follow man's ways and it is making them like when they're thinking about having to be circumcised in order to come to the faith, they're like, oh, I don't know about this faith stuff. However, I said, I think this is more about how this false gospel will toss you around and it will make you feel chaotic and confused. Because remember, the enemy will always disguise himself as an angel of light. And so this false gospel doesn't appear as something bad. So it's hard for me to think that this is referring to the queasiness that they're feeling. I think it is more so being disguised as something good for them. And therefore, they're starting to get a little bit confused and tossed around in their faith. So what would be the motive of distorting or perverting this gospel? Why were these people doing it? Well, because if you really think about it, the gospel is actually offensive to our hum humanity. It offends our pride by telling us we have all fallen short and we need a savior. It offends our wisdom by going against everything that makes sense, that a man would actually choose to die an excruciating death for all of us, you know, people who are full of sin when he wasn't. And it also offends our knowledge. It goes against what science has proven in the timeline of the earth, the creation of the world, evolution, the impossibility of the resurrection. So they began preaching a false gospel, making people think that there was no need to change. You were born that way. God loves you for who you are. He wants you to live a life free to be whatever you want. He welcomes all people into the kingdom of God. And that ultimately leads to the rejection of the true gospel. Or on the flip side of that, which is what they were probably preaching at this time, was that you won't go to heaven unless you're circumcised, baptized, keep every commandment eyesed, and all you have is legalistic religion at that point. And it made people sick to their stomachs instead of excited to live their new life in this new freedom. Now, the gospel literally means good news. It isn't that complicated. If it isn't bringing good or producing good or righteousness in your life, then it isn't the goods. But even if an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. So he's like, for the people in the back, I'm going to say it again. So the gospel, again, being the good news. If that is not what is being preached to you, it ain't the goods. And that person will be cursed. For, verse 10, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Okay. This was the bomb that was dropped on me this morning. So, you know, like I said, I've been trying to do everything I can to please everyone, asking for everyone's opinions, offering to do everything I can, going out of my way and spending more time to try to help everybody, which by the way, the two video thing, not going to work out. And I sincerely apologize if I got anyone's hopes up because what I thought might be a simple quick edit turned into hours and hours of overtime and disasters that had me working yesterday's study for 15 hours on Thanksgiving, you know, only stopping to go and eat. And I don't want you to feel bad about that. I just, I did it because I really wanted to try to put my best foot forward. And I thought I'm just gonna invest the time now so that later on it'll be a little bit easier. And honestly, it just left me feeling so defeated and so exhausted. And that second video, I did end up posting it. I ended up being told by people who I trust dearly that it actually wasn't very effective. And the interesting thing is, is that 
video actually buried our original video where people couldn't even find it. So they were kind of stuck watching the one with the commentary at the end. And so I was like, okay, I'm scratching this idea. And honestly, it has lifted a really heavy burden off of my shoulders. But man, did the Lord do a sitting down with me on this today? asking me, why are you trying to please everyone? And in my panic spirit, I was just like, well, I don't want to let anybody down. And I realized in that moment that I was disguising pleasing man with not wanting to disappoint people. But it's the same thing. And the Lord so quickly told me, I never asked you to help everyone. Only I can help everyone. I asked you to be faithful. And when you're trying to help everyone, your foundation is shifting. And I was like, ouch, that was a good piece of humble pie the day after being stuffed full. So we can't please everyone. And even with the best intentions, trying to do so will leave you spiritually bankrupt. And on the flip side of that, you know, we can't put expectations on people to please our every need because they aren't God. Only he can do that. But when we're like Paul and we are single-minded in our desire to please God, not making decisions on everyone else's opinions, we'll be blessed and our foundation will be sure and our days will be prosperous because you will be covered by the grace and peace. And if some people are disappointed with that, well, that's not on you. So I don't know if anyone else needs this heart check today, but who are you living your life for? Who are you trying to please or who are you worried about disappointing, God or man? And I want to just say thank you to everybody who has been so gracious. I mean, on both sides, whether or not you liked the commentary throughout or at the end, both sides have been very sweet and saying, you know, Kanoi, whatever way you do it, we're here. We like it this way, but you know, you got to do what you got to do. So I appreciate that. Thank you very much for being supportive in that. Okay. Verse 11, for I would have, you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel for I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Now there have been many people who have taken this very idea and run with it claiming to have gotten a new revelation from God that is contrary to the word of God. And remember, Paul's revelation was really unique and uncommon. I mean, most people hear the gospel through someone else, whereas Paul actually had a divine encounter with God. So we've got to be really careful about new revelation because there are tons of books out there. I mean, tons of YouTube videos. You know, you can probably find evidence for any belief at this point. And again, a lot of the time, it does come from a well-intentioned heart. You know, someone trying to enlighten others or free them from religion, but not every insight is true revelation from God. And we really have to be careful with this, especially about listening to every single voice we hear. Just because something is published doesn't make it truth, because if it doesn't line up with what God has spoken, or if it is causing confusion or shifting in your foundation, then I would more than question its validity. And Paul was never trying to reach up and find a new revelation so that he could wow the crowds with his holiness or sell millions of books. God simply reached down to him so that he could communicate to the masses. And we need more of that than ever, you know, where we can simply be before the Lord, be still before him and allow him to reveal things to us through his word instead of solely relying on books or social media content to feed us. So heart check, where is your revelation coming from? Is the Lord speaking directly to you through his word and through prayer? Or are you being tossed around in your beliefs based off of other people's insights? Now, with that said, Obviously, we need insight. I mean, that's what teachers are for, and that is a God-given gift. But what is being taught should always be in alignment with the word. It should work to bring unity instead of trying to divide, and it ultimately should bring you closer to Jesus and what he taught. Verse 13, for you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my father. So he's like, listen, I've been in your shoes. But when he who had set 
me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. So Jesus did reveal himself to Paul the way that Jesus will be revealed to us so that he can then be revealed in us. So this word to here in other translations actually says revealed his son in me. And so you could look at it both ways. You know, Jesus will always be revealed to us, but it is so that he can then be revealed in us and through us. And he went away to Arabia instead of going, you know, to the typical places where he could preach. That means he went into the desert. He didn't have a doctorate of divinity. He had a doctorate of the desert. And I've said many times before that some of the greatest testimonies come out of those desert seasons and those wilderness seasons of your life. Verse 18, then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas, Peter, by the way, and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. So this goes to show that apostles are not limited to the 12 disciples, since he's speaking about James, the Jesus' half-brother. In what I'm writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went to the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only were hearing it, said, He who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God because of me. And at the end of the day, or I guess at the end of the chapter, what Paul is saying here is that the gospel he is preaching is the one and only true gospel, because it wasn't taught by anyone but God to him. And remember, he was an anonymous Christian for three years before meeting Peter, James, and John, and any of the apostles, and before anybody ever affirmed what the Lord had actually revealed to him. And the Lord will do that. I mean, he will confirm his message that he gives to you, because he is a God of unity and a God of truth. And what is spoken by him is the only thing that will save us and make a real difference in our lives. Chapter two, then after 14 years. So what is this 14 years? Well, he spent the three years in the desert and then he spent 11 years going through Syria, Cilicia, and then he went back to his hometown in Tarsus. So that equaled out to about 13 to 14 years, depending on how you look at it. So after the 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. So who is Titus? Well, we'll find out later. He is the young convert of Paul's who ends up following along with him, and he ends up being a teacher as well. And we'll find out about him in the book of Titus. I went up because of a revelation set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, probably meaning Peter, James, and John. The gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. Now, there are two ways of looking at this. He may have been bringing his gospel before Peter, James, and John in order to check them and whether or not they were actually in alignment with the truth. Because remember, there were all kinds of contentions in the church at Antioch. So he may have needed to do some correcting here so that the work he had done thus far wasn't being compromised. Or Paul was a man of humility and willing to be checked in his own humanity. He may have actually been seeking accountability for the very things that God had spoken to him. And maybe he wanted to make sure that what he was doing and saying was bringing unity and not division. And we too should have an inner circle like this, you know, people who can heart check us. I've got that here in our Bible study. There's a few trusted voices who I know are both loving and theologically sound that I will from time to time run things by them to make sure that I'm not out in left field or they will even come to me and be like, hey, girl, have you ever heard about this? And Paul was willing to be teachable if it didn't mean straying from the truth that he knew. So heart check. Do you have an inner circle of trusted voices who can hold you accountable? Verse three, but even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. And so why would he even be circumcised? He's not Jewish. Well, because remember, those Jewish Christians believed that if you were going to come into the faith as a Gentile, into the faith of, of being a Christian, you would first have to become a Jew, right? So they're saying, 
he's a Greek, but we are not forcing him to be circumcised because he's not Jewish. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they might bring us into slavery, to them we did not yield in submission even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. So why are they doing this? Why are they insisting that Titus doesn't get circumcised? Where we saw yesterday, they were insisting that Timothy be circumcised because remember, he was half Jew. And so this would have discredited what Paul had spoken about being saved by grace through faith. If they let Titus be circumcised, that would have been a big old waste by saying, you know what, let's go ahead and circumcise him to please everybody else. It's going to go against the gospel that he is preaching. And these false brothers who are secretly being brought in are kind of known as pseudo Christians. You know, they're speaking the right words. They're doing the right things. They're saying they're Christian. They're basically a bonsai tree that is carved out into a dog, but it's still a bonsai tree, you know, so they are pseudo Christians, fake Christians. These people are trying to regulate the new freedom that they have gotten in this new gospel. And from those who seem to be influential, by the way, what they were makes no difference to me because, you know, God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. Now, this is not Paul being prideful and saying, I can't learn from any of y'all. But what he was saying was that his faith and his spiritual growth wasn't going to hinge on someone else. He wasn't going to wait around for someone's great message of revelation that would then give him a 10-step process on how to be a good Christian. He was taking personal responsibility. Remember, our relationship with Christ is personal. It cannot be built upon someone else's relationship or someone else doing the work for you. There has to be effort on your part to get to know Christ, to have conversation with him. You know, you got to love Paul. He sticks it to us and he's like, y'all need to grow up. So heart check. How's your faith growing? Are you still bottle feeding or are you starting to stand on your own and eat more solid food? And by the way, being on a bottle, not a bad thing, you know, because everyone starts there. As long as you are growing and you are hitting milestones, just like a baby is expected to grow into maturity. And we will always need that guidance, but we won't always need hand holding. And once you do start to walk on your own, you will realize how much freedom it actually brings and your fire and your passion are only going to increase. Now, on the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, so to the Jews, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Only they asked us to remember the poor, that very thing I was eager to do. This is a little bit comical here. I don't know if this is a little tongue in cheek, but... Paul actually was always concerned about the poor. So he's like, they're telling me to do something that I've already been doing. I mean, he already had an ongoing concern for them. And so when he says that they gave the right hand of fellowship, this means that they basically said, you know what? We're giving our acceptance of you as being a teacher to the Gentiles. And so this just goes to show that there is indeed different types of teachers, different types of teaching styles. There's different denominations. That's why God created these, I believe, these different denominations, because everybody is going to be able to find their place in the faith. And it's not a bad thing, but we've got to remember that every denomination that is going to claim Christianity has to be Jesus-centered. It has to lift up Jesus. And if it doesn't, it's probably not teaching the true gospel. And this is not an absolute here. Like he's not saying, you know, you guys can only preach to the Jews and I can only preach to the Gentiles. I mean, they all taught to both, but he's just saying that everybody has their strengths and has their gifts. And it's kind of like my strength is doing commentary throughout the Bible study, whereas other people's strengths are going through the reading and then having their commentary at the end. Operate in your strength. I've got to remember that. I'm praying for an editing team and for other people to be able to help us out so one day maybe we can do both things without creating more stress. But anyway, that's beside the point. And so now Paul is going to do a public correction of Peter. 
But when Cephas, and again, this is Peter, and if you were confused like I was, Cephas actually means stone. And the Greek word for Cephas is Petros. So that's where we got the English translation of Peter. So same same name, same but different. <laughs> okay, but when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. So basically, he was wrong in what he was saying. We're going to see why in just a second. But why is Paul all of a sudden so bold to correct him? For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. We know that Peter is the one who had that vision of the sheet coming down and there were all types of animals on it. And the Lord told him, Peter, kill and eat, right? So basically saying the Jews and the Gentiles can all come to the faith. Everybody's declared clean. But because he feared this circumcision party who he probably knew would go back and report to the church that he was eating with Gentiles, he then went back on his word and refused to eat with the Gentiles. And so Paul is doing a big old correcting over here, especially because Peter's coming into his territory and bringing that thought process with him. So he's like, I am not about to have you polluting my church. So sometimes there has to be a line drawn because, of course, Doors for the church are always open. Doors to this Bible study, always open to anybody. But there will be a time, like I keep petty comments up. I don't really care about those kinds of petty criticism comments, but I will delete a comment that tries to pull away the flock to a different teaching or to a false gospel. Those are the things that I will not tolerate here because as a shepherd, I have a responsibility to protect the flock. And that is what Paul is doing here as well. Verse 13, and then the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. So whenever we sin, we will take people down with us and no one is exempt. I mean, look at Barnabas, one of the greatest teachers of all time. He also fell to this type of thinking. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, remember I said he says this a lot, the truth of the gospel, uh, said to Cephas before them all, so he did this publicly, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like a Jew? So he's basically saying, you guys are being hypocrites here. You know, we don't need Gentiles trying to act like a Jew in order to receive grace. Verse 15, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Now, whenever he says we are Jews by birth, this this isn't putting him in any sort of privilege, but he is saying, because we are Jews by birth, we should have the privilege of knowing what the word says, unlike the Gentiles. So we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith, meaning we have been given a favorable verdict by Christ to the Father and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. So there is nothing you can do. There's no amount of church services you can attend. You can't check off all the boxes of Bible study for 15 years. None of that will justify you before the Lord. It is only going to be the grace of God that is given to us as a free gift and the fact that we believe in that gift. But if in our endeavor to be justified by Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. So Paul is not saying that the law is dead, which a lot of people will actually try to say that thing is, is that the law can't die in and of itself because it reflects God's heart and his character. But what he is saying is that he is now dead in the law. He is free from its dominion and its control over him. It no longer holds him captive, you know, constantly showing him how much of a failure he is. And that's why Christ died for us to fulfill that law, not to kill it. 
So again, Paul drives it home. This whole chapter is summed up in this, that salvation is by grace alone. And if you try to add anything to that and earn righteousness through the law, then we are saying that Christ's work on the cross was insufficient and that he therefore died in vain. But when we die to the law, we are now living to God, Christ in us. And I love how this point is driven home through a big old mess. You know, this could have ended disastrously, but God turned it around for good because one man, Paul, was willing to do the uncomfortable and to make the correction. You know, Peter and Barnabas, they were strengthened in the end in their faith through this whole mishap. And then there was a hard line that was drawn between different beliefs. The truth was now spelled out clearly for both the Jew and the Gentile. And then the Gentile's faith was also strengthened. And we too, even through this circumstance, are affirmed in our own faith as this truth continues to live today. So if Paul didn't stand his ground, we would all be in a different place. And so Paul finished giving his personal testimony in chapters one and two and displaying grace through it all, right? But now he's actually going to move into giving instructions to help guide that doctrine of grace. And he starts off here, oh, foolish Galatians. And when he says foolish, he's saying, listen, I'm not saying you guys don't have knowledge, but y'all are lacking wisdom. You have all the knowledge. You just don't apply it very well. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Meaning who has put you under a curse? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. So in other words, he was basically a billboard. It was clear as day that he was crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain because they were persecuted, you know, for this simple grace that they were believing in? If indeed it was in vain, does he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? just as Abraham believed, and it was counted to him as righteousness. So Paul is using this example of Abraham as his basis for the truth of the gospel because they did consider Abraham a superior ancestor. Now, some rabbis didn't really look at Abraham as some divine figure, but Paul is driving home the grace-based salvation, and he's doing so through the story of Abraham and proving how it wasn't anything that Abraham did that made him righteous, but rather his belief and his trust in God. And then God counted that as righteousness to him. So it wasn't actually his faith that made him righteous, but it was his God that did so because of his faith. So this is important to catch because we can sometimes become self-righteous in our own faith. So even faith needs to be kept in perspective. For us, that means that we are counted as righteous when we believe with faith in Jesus and what he did for us. So that is how we are counted righteous. It's not just our faith alone. It is faith in Jesus. It truly comes back to what he did on the cross. And our faith in that is what is going to then count to us or be counted to us as righteousness. Know then, so he, this is not a suggestion. He's like, I need y'all to know this. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. So basically anybody who believes are now within that family. Of believers and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying in you shall all the nations be blessed so he's saying don't you remember whenever that was spoken that was with the intention that even the Gentiles were going to be brought into the family of God so then those who are in of the faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written in Deuteronomy 27, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Meaning all people are cursed because nobody can keep all the laws, not just one or two of them. We're, we're talking all of them. You got to keep them. So this is bad news. <laughs> Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law for the righteous shall live by faith. So here he is 
uh, quoting Habakkuk 2.4. And it is an honor that we get to live by faith. You know, this isn't something that we carry around as a burden. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. So he redeemed us, meaning he bought back. He paid for us to be released of the curse. And this is how he did it, by becoming that curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So through what Christ did on the cross, we now receive a promise, the way that Abraham received a promise of the Holy Spirit, and we receive it through faith, meaning we also get the power of that spirit and the blessing of that spirit. So now we're in the good news. He gave us the bad news. Now we got the good news. Verse 15, to give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it's been ratified. So in other words, once you sign on that dotted line with somebody else in a, in a, in a contract, no one, not one side can go and say, you know what, I'm gonna make some changes here and there without that person knowing that doesn't happen. You're now held to that contract. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. And this is singular. It does not say to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring, who is Christ. So let's go back here. The promises were made to Abraham and to Jesus right? This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise and he gave it fully in that promise. So what is he saying here? Because that's a whole lot of, of words. Basically, he's saying that the law does not have the power to legally or even logically negate the blessing that God gave to Abraham because it was a promise. And essentially, I guess he's kind of saying that a promise is held to a higher standard than a law because a law involves two sides. It involves two parties, whereas a promise is one-sided. It is just straight given. And just as the blessing that is given to us by Christ is not given or made void when we keep or fail to keep the law, because that promise has been given to us. It's not going to be taken away from us, hinging upon whether or not we are obedient to all of the commandments and the laws. So why then the law? It was added because of transgression until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. So tradition says that uh, the law was given on Mount Sinai by angels to Moses. That's what he's talking about. Now, an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. So again, he's saying, OK, so the law needed a mediator, whereas a promise doesn't. A promise is just given by God alone. There is no intermediary necessary. And the law here, why was it given? Again, because of sin. And Jesus then came to take that sin away. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. So the option here would have been either you keep the law and you keep it in its fullness, which by the way is not possible, so we actually need the Savior. But if we don't know the law, if we've never had the law, we would never be able to even appreciate what the Lord has done for us. Because we would be like, why is he here? What's he showing up for? What do we need him here for? So it is important that we teach both the grace-based faith, but also the law. Because we still need to have in perspective that we are a sinner and we are in need of a savior in order to get saved and to have that faith that we will have eternal life if we receive Jesus as our savior, as the one who did come as that sacrifice to die for us. Now... Verse 23, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. So basically it was our protector. How did it protect us or guard us? Well, look, 
It shows us God's heart because like we said, every law that was ever made was made out of love and for our protection. So it shows us the heart of God. It shows us the best way to live. It shows us how we can earn approval and disapproval of man here on earth. It provides a foundation for civil law to be formed. And it exposes our sin, which this is the ultimate reason why we needed the law, so that it then points us to Jesus, which ultimately gives us protection from eternal death. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you, as were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. So meaning we were fully immersed in to Christ and have put on Christ, meaning we have put on the garments of that righteousness, that forgiveness, that those that pureness. So stop trying to put on other clothes. We don't we don't need to anymore. <laughs> there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male or female for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So there is no longer division. There's no Jew or Gentile. It is we are all in the church as believers. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So if you have ever been confused about that whole thing of us becoming grafted into the olive tree, <laughs> grafted into Israel, well, this is easily giving you an explanation of that. If you're in Christ, then you are considered an offspring of Abraham, a child of God. You are part of God's people and God's nation now according to the promise that was given to Abraham that he would be a blessing, that Israel would be a blessing to all nations. So I don't know if you got as beat up as I did with this reading today, but hope you got something good out of it. Let us know in the comments below how God spoke to your heart through this reading of the word. And then we will continue the book of Galatians on Sunday as tomorrow is my Sabbath day. So we'll see you again on Sunday. So we thank you, Lord, for this word today. Thank you so much for the life of Paul, for his boldness and being able to make correction where necessary. Lord, I thank you for the very people you always put in our path who sometimes need to show us where we are going astray, Lord, so that we can be faith, uh, strengthened in our faith and so that we can go down the right road and ultimately help others do the same. So I just thank you for this reminder today of what the purpose of the law was to point us to you, Jesus, and to show us how much we needed you to be able to come and free us from the law and from how it was holding us captive. However, Lord, it also puts into perspective that it was actually there for our protection. It was there to guide us. It was there out of love. And so I just thank you, Father, for loving us so much, for guarding us as your children, and for always wanting to keep us out of harm's way. And so I just pray, Lord, that we'll never stray from that, that we will stay under the shadow of your wings, that we will continue to hold on to you and cling to you so desperately, Lord, as we navigate through this life. Forgive us, Lord, where we have ever tried to please man before we have ever tried to please you. So that is a big reminder for us, God, to always come to you first in all things, for wisdom, even in the smallest changes that we're trying to make in our life. May we never forget to consult with you first because we never know where a small change can act actually have big results in the end. So we always want to be guided by your Holy Spirit. I pray that you will increase that sensitivity for us to be able to hear your directions and to be able to receive those directions far out, Lord, that wisdom positioning system. Give us the direction before the turn so we don't have to be rerouted after. So we love you so much, Lord, and I pray that you will bless every person here. Meet their needs, Lord. Let them know that you are with them, that you love them, and that you indeed are blessing their life. We praise you, we love you, and honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Heaven and salvation is a divine gift that is given to us by grace. None of us deserve it. In fact, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death, and every single one of us have fallen short, and then we desperately need someone to pay that price. And Jesus did it. He didn't do it because we are righteous on our own merit. He did it because he loves us, and he wants to spend eternity with us. But it won't happen if we don't receive him before we leave this earth as Lord and Savior. Hell is a very real thing. And there is no second chance after we take our last breath here. So I want to be able to give someone the opportunity today who is saying, I'm ready. 
I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm going to end up after I die, but I don't want to live another day without knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt where I am going to end up. I see now that this is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're going to say a prayer and I'm going to put the words on the screen so that you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that he died and rose again, then you will be saved. So we're going to say this prayer together. Believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I confess my sins to you today, and I turn from them, and I now live my life for you. I know that I am forgiven of all my sins, so I receive you now as Lord and Savior, and I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.